Hey everyone, welcome to this week's reading of The Wizard and the Frog. So uh, we're picking up with chapter two. Um, if, if, you miss, if you missed the last one, go check it out before you re, uh, listen to this one. So I don't know, we'll just go ahead and jump into it. Uh, chapter two, A Golden Quest. Sort of. What does that mean? Well, I can sometimes control the magic to do what I want. A lot of times, though, things like this happen. Seriously? Yes. We stared at each other in silence. I was trying to wrap my mind around a wizard who wasn't that good with magic. It was difficult. Actually, it was impossible. I couldn't wrap my mind around it. How did you finish your time at the academy, I asked. They kicked me out, Dormus answered. They called me a liability. That's rubbish. I just need more time to perfect my skills, that's all. <clears throat> uh, well, I think you've done enough damage here. Seeing as how Pomeria is a frog now, I'm sure she's going to be even more angry than she was as a human. You can leave now. I can't, Gomer said. You can't what? I can't leave. I've sworn a life debt to you, and you accepted it. So? Take it back. It doesn't work like that. What do you mean, I asked. A life debt is a form of magic, Gormus explained. The word of an elf is magical, which is why we don't lightly use them. So how do you break the spell? Once I've paid back my debt, the spell will go away. Well, well, well. Seems things weren't actually going my way now. Instead, they had just gotten far worse. Not only was Pomeria a frog now, but I was also stuck with an elven wizard who sucked at magic and was bound to me until he saved my life. Great. Just great. I sighed. Fine. Change her back. Dormus smiled thinly. Are you kidding me right now? Sorry. His face scrunched in mock agony. I didn't mean to turn her into one so I have no idea how to turn her back into a human. Wow, you're a really helpful wizard, you know that? Dormer shrugged. You said do something. I tried. I laughed and shook my head, then knelt in front of the frog that was Pomeria. I'll find a way to get you changed back, I said softly. I hoped she could understand me. You damn well better, Pomeria's voice came out of the frog's mouth. I fell backward, surprised. Did you just talk? You're lucky I'm a frog right now, Pomeria threatened. I'd love to smack you over the head right now. Even better. My gods, could the day get any worse? There was a knock at the door. Can you get that? I asked Dee. The elf opened the door, and an older man stepped inside. He was dirty, but not like a homeless person. The dirt that covered him was from the road, and from the amount of dirt on him, he must have traveled a long way. Jack? The man asked. That's me, I replied. Thank goodness. We need your help. I'm in the middle of something, I said, but we're being terrorized by a monster. There's a few people I know who could help you out. If you've got problems with a goblin or an orc, these people can take care of you. And they charge less than I do, too. Oh, no, sir. We, have, we do not have problems with an orc or a goblin. The wicked creature that haunts us is much more powerful. A troll? No, sir. A vampire. I was fairly certain my heart fell into my stomach. A vampire? Gods above, I'd never seen one, but I knew they existed. Creatures of darkness, able to use magic without words. They lived in the, in the shadows, creating misery and fear wherever they went. I, I frowned. It was my oath to fight monsters, but Pomeria was a frog right now. Priorities, decisions, this was too stressful. Please, sir, she commands the darkness. She's ensorcelled seven dwarf, dwarven miners to do her bidding and controls the animals. Our children, sir. Some of them have gone missing. The image of the half-eaten limbs of children from my troll job came back to me, haunting me. I couldn't let these people down. I looked at Pomeria, her green flesh, slick and slimy. I'd have to figure out what to do with her. I'll come, I answered the old man. Where is your town? A week's ride north, he answered. The city of Therm. We're ruled by Lord Scrin. I know it, I answered. I have to arrange some things, but I will be there as soon as possible. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Dormerus walked the man out and shut the door behind them. You know I have to do this, I said to Pomeria. I know, she replied, but you need to get me changed back first. I don't know if I can, I said. You don't have a choice. The tone in her voice made me aware that she was not happy. When Dormerus came back inside, I looked at him. We're going to the academy, I announced. Why exactly? Why do you think, I asked. There's real wizards there. We'll get one of them to turn Pomeria back, and then we'll help the people of Therm. I don't think the academy is going to help, Dormerus said. They have to. They can't just leave her as a frog. I suppose it's worth a try, Dormerus said, though I have heard of something that turned someone back into a human once. What? 
There's a story of someone who once kissed a frog and the frog turned into a man. Pomer is a woman, obviously, but it still might work. That's a true story, I asked. Absolutely, Dormer said. Right. I looked at Pomeria, who looked up at me. If she knew what I was thinking about how I didn't want to kiss her right now, she'd probably kill me. I picked her up, cupped her gently in my hands, and held my breath. I tried to picture Pomeria in her elven form, in her human form, and pretend that I was kissing her normal self. I closed my eyes and leaned my head down. Another inch, and her slimy skin would touch my lips. I pecked her on the head, then turned and spat. When I looked back at Pomeria, she was glaring at me. Well, as much of a glare as a frog could muster. It didn't work, I grunted. At least you tried, right? I glared at Dormaris. Let's get to the academy. The longer Pomeria stays a frog, the longer she's going to hate me. I gently placed Pomeria into a pouch at my waist and left the house. Dormaris followed, whether because the spell forced him to or because he wanted to. I didn't know. Thankfully, Chasm was only a half-hour trek from our rural town. I was exhausted. My muscles ached from exertion and from the troll blows the troll had struck. And now my brain hurt from thinking. If your magic always does this, what exactly did you do that got you kicked out of the academy? I asked, curious. That's a long story, Dormus answered. We've got a decent walk. Start talking. I accidentally summoned a dragon, he said sheepishly. That's it? Well, no. The dragon set fire to part of the town, and it took several of the headmasters to banish it. What were you actually trying to do? I asked, almost afraid to know the answer. Uh, change water into wine. That's a massive difference in results, I said, shaking my head in disbelief. Dormers didn't say anything in reply. I almost felt bad for the guy. He clearly had the calling for magic, but for whatever reason, it didn't work for him. That or he didn't know how to control it. With all the training academy the academy offered, it would seem that control shouldn't be the issue. Well, regardless of what the underlying problem was, the, the faster he could repay his debt and be on his way, the better. <clears throat> we spent the rest of the walk in silence. I occasionally heard Pomeria cursing from my pouch, but I tried to ignore that. If we couldn't find a wizard who could restore her back to normal, my life was going to be a mess. Besides not getting married and having kids, what was I supposed to do with her? Set her loose in a pond somewhere? Gods, it was too much to worry about. Chasm's borders came into view, and the city guards let us in with bored expressions on their faces. I led the way towards the academy, a large, square-shaped building on the northern end of the city. Chasm wasn't huge, but it was growing rapidly. People of all races were moving here, hoping to be part of the city lord's dream of making it the jewel of the south. I still didn't know exactly what he meant by that. The academy was surrounded by a mix of stone walls and iron gates. Two guards stood at the entrance, but these weren't city guards. These men wore the robes of wizards and wielded staffs. Not very imposing unless you knew what a wizard was capable of, and I was well aware of what they could do. Dormerous aside, I'd spent plenty of time in the presence of a few wizards. Most of them were self-absorbed, greedy, power-hungry, and absolutely insane. Mostly insane. While Dormerous seemed to defy that trend, his downfall was his inability, inability to control his magic. If it weren't for that, he might be the perfect partner to hunt monsters with. Do you have an appointment? One of the guards asked as we approached. No, I answered. I need to see someone about reversing a spell. What kind of spell? The second guard asked. The one, the two looked as dissimilar as a bird and a snake. The first guard who spoke had a shaved head, brown eyes, and a thin goatee beginning to sprout from his chin. He was skinny, and his robes looked too big for him. The other one was an older man with graying hair and blue eyes that seemed to hold his years within them. They seemed like reasonable men, so I, hope, I was hoping that they would let me in without an issue. Well, I pulled Pomeria out of my pocket. This is my girlfriend. The guards exchanged glances, and the older man smiled. We don't do that kind of magic here. No, of course not, I laughed. I meant, this is, my girl, this is what my girlfriend was turned into. She was a human, but this one, I nodded toward Dormorus, turned her into a frog. The younger guard seemed to recognize Dormorus, and his eyes widened. Gods, he breathed. You must have horrible luck to have come in contact with him. Lately, it seems I don't have any luck, I answered. Do you think someone can help me out? The young guard shook his head. I wouldn't know where to begin. The older man examined Primaria intently. Can she speak, he asked. Yes, I can speak just fine, Primaria answered smugly. Interesting, the old man said. It's rare that a shape-shifting spell can allow a person to keep their ability to speak. Give me a minute. I'll see if I can get you an audience with one of our masters. Thank you, I said. I really appreciate that. The guard went inside the gates and soon disappeared into the building. The younger guard stayed put, keeping a wary eye on Dormorus. You heard what he did, didn't you? He whispered to me. 
Something about a dragon, I asked. The man nodded. That's not all, though. That was the last straw for the headmaster. He's caused all sorts of mischief. Like what? Well, he once turned a statue of the headmaster into a golem. What's a golem, I asked. It's like an elemental, but it doesn't occur naturally. It's basically a living creature made of stone or clay. It nearly destroyed half the east wing and almost killed a student. I didn't know what an elemental was either, but I got the point. The more I heard about Dormerus's misguided magic, the more I started to worry he was going to put me into a bad situation. Well, I was in a bad situation already, but a worse situation. If I were battling a monster and he cast a spell accidentally, who knows what could happen? I was starting to think I should be afraid for my life around him. A few minutes later, the old guard returned. He eyed Dormerus curiously, then looked at me. Well, most of the masters declined to help, mainly because of your friend here. That's just wonderful, I groaned. There is one who agreed to see you, but I have to warn you. He looked at his younger counterpart, and they shared some sort of knowing look. Master Zalor is a bit of an oddity. He has some quirks that are best left overlooked. I can do that. I deal with all sorts of oddities in my line of work, I said. The guards were quiet, so I assumed they were waiting on an explanation. I hunt monsters, I added. Ah, they said in unison. Right then, follow me and I'll escort you to his office. The younger guard continued to stare at Dormorus mistrustfully. But they allowed him to come too. We walked in behind the older wizard in single file, and I stared at everything. I'd never been inside the academy before, so every sight was new to me. We traveled along narrow corridors, up huge flights of steps, and finally through a vast hall that contained a door every 20 feet. <clears throat> I assumed these were the offices of the masters. Most of them were shut. The one we stopped at was open. The old man knocked anyway, and with a voice, and a voice within told us to come in. The guard waved us, and we, but he stayed outside. Once inside, he shut the door, and we stood in the most bizarrely decorated room I'd ever seen. Multicolored rugs covered the floors, their bright, vivid colors, stark contrast to the tapestries hanging on the walls. There was a bright cover. There was a table covered in globes of clear glass, beakers and burners, and all sorts of gadgets that appeared to have gears and cogwheels that allowed them to operate. Master Zalor appeared to have a love for the extraordinary. That wasn't so peculiar. Perhaps his trinkets, foreign and different, made his fellows think he was too odd, that he too was the odd one out. I shrugged and turned my attention to him, Master Zalor, who sat behind a huge desk made of oak wood. It was covered with books and pieces of parchment, all of which were scattered about haphazardly. Welcome, he greeted. He stood up, and I realized why I hadn't noticed him when he first entered the room. His clothing was the exact same color and design as his chair. It was like he was wearing a camouflage of sorts. Uh, hello, I replied. I tilted my head in greeting, not sure exactly how to show respect to a wizard. I hear you have a problem most distressing. Yes, I do. Dormorus here turned my girlfriend into a frog. Master Zalor nodded. I heard, and you've come here looking to have it reversed. I completely understand. Magic is a fickle mistress, one that can change its loyalty from doing what you need to doing what it wants. I can help to change the frog back into her human form, but I'm going to need a few things, things that will you will need to retrieve. I focus on every word, he said. This man was going to be my savior, so I wanted to make sure I heard every detail. Absolutely, I said. Anything you need. Good, good, he replied. The things I need will not be easy to possess, so take heed that you use caution. I'm used to dealing with danger. I hunt monsters for a living, so I felt like I didn't need to finish that sentence. Master Zalor grinned at me. His top and scissors shined with gold and silver. The left one was silver, and the right one was gold, but the top, but, but, the bo but on the bottom portion of his mouth, the metal was reversed. It looked strange to me, but who cared? So long as he could get Primaria back to normal, that was all I cared about. Even so, the Master Wizard continued, I must warn you about the hazards involved. I don't want your blood on my hands if something befalls you, any of you. Understandable, I said. I accept any and all risks. Good. I need a golden egg and a unicorn. I stared at the man and waited for him to laugh, crack a smile, or imply in some way that he was joking. When he didn't, I cleared my throat and scratched my chin. Small dry flakes of skin covered my fingertips and I brushed them off onto my pants. Uh, a golden egg, I asked, and a unicorn. Massalor said, don't forget the unicorn. That's the most important part. Right. I paused, my brain still tired and stressed from Dormus's rogue spell on my girlfriend. Where exactly do I get a golden egg or a unicorn? Far to the south is a mountain that rises above everything around it. Within that mountain is a vast maze of tunnels filled with traps of every conceivable type. 
beyond those traps is a magical creature, a goose that lays golden eggs. It's guarded by minotaurs, but who have kept the goose under tight watch for years. They melt down the eggs and cast their own coins and have built a tremendous wealth for themselves. That is where you must go to find the golden egg. Wait, are you talking about the minotaur triad? The same. I groaned. This was going to be harder than I thought. The Minotaur Tribe was an organized crime syndicate, one whose power and cruelty were to be respected, if not feared. Everyone knew they had more wealth than King Edwin himself, but there weren't many people who, who knew where they got it from. It seems Master of Zalore had done his homework. It's a suicide mission, I said. If we are able to get inside their fortress, there's no telling how long it would take to navigate the tunnels. It's been purposefully designed to lead people into traps, all to protect the goose. Hence my disclaimer about danger, Master Lizalore said. If you can't retrieve the items I need, then your girlfriend will have to remain a frog. And that wouldn't be good for anyone, least of all her. Shapeshifting can be addictive to the wizards who practice it. If they spend too much time in a different state, eventually they won't be able to change back. What are you saying, I asked, feeling dread worm its way into my stomach. If your girlfriend remains a frog for too long, she, I won't be able to change her back. No one will. Gods above, I cursed. Well, that's great. In the unbelievable chance that I managed to rip off the Minotaur triad, where the hell do we find a unicorn? I thought they were all dead. Master Zalor ran his hand through his long white beard, easily a foot in length. I think you should focus your attention on the egg for now. The unicorn is less of an issue in regards to reaching it. If you were willing to retrieve the egg, I can speed up your journey by transporting you to the outskirts of the mountain. Too close, and they will assume the Academy took part in this. That's a liability I can't risk. I started to consider that Master Zalor was not officially allowed to do anything like this. That was his problem, though, not mine. I will go. Can Pomeria stay here under your care, I asked. I'm afraid not, he answered. I have too many duties to attend, and I would hate for her to get lost or stepped on. Great. I guess I was going to have to take her with me. I assume you'll need some supplies. Dormaris can take you to the armory. There's also a pantry there, so collect what you need, and I'll get the portal ready. We left Master Zalor's chamber, and Dormaris took the lead. We went back the way we'd come, down the massive staircase, and then down another stairwell that led further below the ground level to the academy of the academy. A colossal set of wooden doors is where we ended up. Two men, barely into their teens, struggled to open the doors. They eventually managed to budge one enough that we could fit through. The armory was surprisingly small. The chamber had less room than Master Zalor's office, but the weapons offered were incredible. I found a sword in flawless condition and picked it up to examine it. The hilt was wrapped in black leather, and the pommel was a rounded blue stone. Uh, left to guess, I assumed it was a sapphire. The guard and the blade itself appeared to be made of silver, but I knew it couldn't be real silver. The blade had a gleaming sheen to it. It was beautiful, but I knew it didn't look that nice. It wouldn't look that nice after I used it. Take it, Dormara said, eyeing me. <clears throat> it's a magnificent weapon. I don't want to ruin it, I said. Don't worry about that, the elf replied. It's imbued with powerful spells. It will serve you much better than the weapon you have now. I debated only a moment before pulling my blade, free, my blade free and sheathing the new one. What do I do with mine, I asked. Leave it here. Someone may fix it up. I shrugged and left the blade in the spot I'd found the new one in and headed into the pantry. It was fairly common stuff. Dried jerky, water skins, things that were perfect for long journeys. I grabbed several pieces of the jerky and stuffed them into a sack and added two water skins. The sack had a strap, and I slung it over my shoulder. You ready? I asked Stormers. As ready as I can be, he answered. We made our way back to Master Zalor's chamber and found him waiting for us, an impatient air about him. That took long enough, he muttered. The portal has been open long, too long already. Hurry through before the Minotaurs catch the scent of my magic. We hovered over, hurried over to the portal, which was a swirling, watery mist on the floor. Flashes of light flickered amidst the whirling mass, making it look like a storm. I adjusted the strap of the sack and looked at Master Zalor. Once you get outside the triad's realm, the, the tree is realm, use this to get back here. The old wizard handed me a circular pendant made of wood. It was roughly the size of two coins put together. Think of where you want to be and break it. The spell will activate and take you to the place you were thinking about, as long as it's a real place. Anything else I need to know about? He came to stand behind us and placed a hand on my shoulder. Yes, he answered. Don't die. And then he shoved me into the watery maelstrom. And that's the end of chapter two. So next week, we'll be back with chapter three. Hope you are enjoying this. It was, uh, it was fun to write this one. So thanks for listening.